Um, I, <laughs> yes, sir. You, I mean. You know how to get the audience together, kiddo. He's written a fabulous book, Gilbert Harrison. We were in college together. So it's awfully nice to have friends that you stay friends with all these years. Anyway, I want to welcome you. You are about, and I swear to you, here, one of the tremendously talented, wonderful guitarists. None of this would happen if it wasn't for Ford Lagerstaff. He was the teacher, still is a teacher, and the only reason I have all these wonderful people is because of Ford. So I'm going to have Ford introduce Jill, Gigi. And Ford, can you come here? And now I don't know how to turn this off. Just leave it on. Can I leave it on? So don't say anything you're not supposed to. Thank you. Welcome to today's program, and um, I'm going to let Gigi do most of the talking. Um, and uh, I describe her as a bottle of champagne that you've just opened. And uh, she is an um, unbelievable communicator, in addition to a virtuoso guitarist. And Gigi was one of my star uh, fellows in my. Uh, seminar program at the Curtis Institute and from the very beginning uh, she exhibited all the qualities that I think a young artist needs to have and that is enthusiasm enthusiasm and enthusiasm <laughs> in addition to talent and uh, that's off the scale as many of the students at Curtis are and I've asked I'm going to turn everything over to Gigi because she wants to communicate uh, this program to you and describe how it touches her life. And the other thing is, we're not going to have an intermission. The program is going to be short enough that we can sit through it all at once. I hope you're all well supplied with food and drink. But at the <laughs> end, Gigi wants us to have a discussion about the pieces that she is playing. It's an unusual program, and she's an unusually talented and wonderful uh, young woman. So I'm turning it over to Gigi. microphones um, and cables. It's a lot. No, so this is my first time being in Palm Beach. So thank you so much for being here. And I'm so excited to play concerts. This is really, really an amazing thing to do to share my music and my journey with you. You do have an unusual concert program today. And I think that would be okay because I'm going to walk you through everything and it's gonna be a really fun experience. So what I always like to say, it's a little bit of everything in my world. And you know, when you like somebody, um, you make a little mixtape, right? <laughs> a little playlist. So this is my mixtape for you. So thank you for being here. The first piece that I'm going to start with is this beautiful piece by Claudia Sessa. And it's from the late Renaissance and early Baroque time. And she was this amazing composer that also was a nun. And she was an amazing instrumentalist and also a vocalist. So at that time, the biggest career move is to be a royal musician, a court musician. So all the kings, all the queens wanted to hire her for their kingdom. And she always said, no, I don't need fame. I don't need anything else. I write music for God. It's so cool, right? But unfortunately, a lot of her music got lost. And this is one of the two pieces that I transcribed for guitar. 
So this is Claudia Sessa, Ochio Io Visidi Boy. I'm going to jump 500 years. <laughs> so during the pandemic, the beginning of the pandemic, I didn't do anything. I couldn't practice. All my concerts were canceled and I just didn't do anything. I went to bed at 4 a.m., woke up at 2 p.m. and I was okay with it. <coughs> then I was like, okay, this is boring now. Relaxing is really boring. <laughs> so I came up with this album idea, album concept, which was to commission eight composers to write a solo virtuosic guitar music. So I can challenge myself as a performer and as an artist. And I also wanted to explore what 21st century virtuosity looks like and sounds like. So I gathered all my eight composer friends and asked them to write this piece. So the first piece that you're going to hear from that album concept is called Abigail by Natalie Dittrich. Um, she's an amazing composer. She also wrote a guitar concerto for me three years ago, and she knows how to write for guitar. And what she wanted to explore for the guitar virtuosity, she wanted to explore this guitar technique called the campanella. And campanella sounds like this. It's like well, more than one string resonating and creating this beautiful harmony. So let's hear it. So you can hear this resonance, right? And it's always like this beautiful, beautiful guitar technique. She wrote this piece and it was really hard because I had to figure out how to make it ring all the time. To talk about this piece, Abigail is a dear friend of ours. I think she is a friend that we all need. She's the light 
and she is always there, and she helps us through the hardest time. This is Abigail by Natalie Dieterich.
Now we're gonna jump back 200 years. I said it was gonna be an experience. So this is one of my favorite pieces to play. It's called Asturias by Albanese. And this piece was originally for the piano. And the funny thing about this piece is that Albanese wrote this because of, he was so inspired by flamenco and the guitar sound, the rasquiados. <laughs> And so, but the thing is, he actually loved the guitar sound, but never wrote for guitar, which is a very strange thing. He loves the guitar, but he never wrote for it. It would have been amazing. So we guitarist took this piece and transcribed it, and actually more guitarists play this piece than on the piano. It's very interesting. I really like the version on the guitar, I think better than the piano, but that is just my opinion. I want you to judge for it and let me know what you think. So this piece that was originally for um, written for the piano that was imagining the sound of the guitar, but then is transcribed on the guitar. This is Asturias by Albanese.
Water. Oh. I think y'all need wine. <laughs> it's a fun piece. It's one of my favorite pieces. Now we're gonna jump again, <laughs> and we're gonna move to the one of the pieces that I commissioned. And this is written by Hilary Prankton, who is also this genius composer. And um, she is actually getting one of her pieces um, commissioned by Philly Orchestra. And she's doing really well. And she also wrote this um, guitar concerto, which we premiered two years ago at Carnegie Hall. It was like one of the most exciting collaborations. And she also used to be my housemate. And I lived with eight housemates in my grad school. and. We had a crazy Latin lore, but we'll we'll get a we'll get into that after a few drinks later. Um, um, but this piece is called Passaggio. So when I asked Hillary to write this this virtuosic piece, she said she asked me, "So Gigi, what makes you vulnerable on stage?" She's like, and I said. Every time I go on stage, I'm vulnerable. When I play these hard passages, I feel vulnerable. And she wanted to play around with the idea of emotional vulnerability 
as a form of virtuosity, which is interesting. And I said, how are you going to do that? And she said, I'll write it and you'll figure it out, you'll see. <laughs> and so she did, she's like, I'm gonna make you sing. And he's like, Hillary, don't you know I'm a guitarist? I don't know, I think you've, you've like, you don't know me or something. We've known each other for six years and you're gonna make me sing. It's only the time that I went to karaoke with you, okay? That's, that's a different story, <laughs> very drunk. Um, uh, and she, she said, no, no, I want you to feel uncomfortable on stage. So I'm going to make you play these very ridiculously hard passages and awkward places so you always don't feel stable on stage. Wow, thank you. Um, but I think that was a really cool thing, this whole feeling of this kind of tense and I'm never feeling grounded. This is what I always feel like. I feel like I'm tiptoeing or just like water over, over, over my neck when I play this piece. And I think it's a really, really cool piece. I love it. This is called Passaggio, where I'm on an unstable journey by the brilliant Hilary Parrington. I hope you enjoy it, Passaggio.
I'm very sweaty. <laughs> it's the humidity. I live in Arizona, so I am not used to humidity, but I love it. I love the sweat. <laughs> okay, now we're going to move back to 150 years ago. Yes. And we're going to play this piece called Recreta de la Alhambra, which is also one of my favorite pieces to play. Um, it's, the, it's a very famous tune. I think you'll all recognize it. But it's a very cool technique called the tremolo. So, you know, as you know, guitars can't sustain a note like the flute or the violin. So we mimic this technique called the tremolo. So it sounds like one sustained note. There's not much to say about that. So this is Recuerdos de la Arambra by Francisco Carga.
have a we have about three pieces left, folks. Um, I'd like to play this piece, and I think you will really like it. Um, this piece is actually called Dinyandi, and it's by this Icelandic composer who happens to be my fiance also. <laughs> we just got engaged over um, winter break. And um, I remember the first time I met him, I really didn't like him. I had this like, um, I have a very competitive nature and I thought he was really cool and he's from Iceland and did all this like minimalist music and compose and he was in my studio. And I remember the first thing I said when I went up to him at the auditions and I said, how old are you? <laughs> he looks young, he looks really young. And then he said, I'm 24. And he's like, oh, you look young. And I just walked away. <laughs> Ever since then, we became really good friends and um, played in a duo together, and I've been working well. Uh, we also played together, and I've always commissioned music from him. And I remember this kind of competitiveness went away when he was, um, we were at a party, and he played some of the music that he wrote. I remember this does not happen Really, it happens really rarely, but I remember listening to his music and time stopped for me. And I love that feeling. It's just like nothing. You don't think about anything else. You just exist with the music. And I remember just like having tears and I was like, oh my gosh, that was so beautiful. I can't hate you anymore. <laughs> you made this. Um, so I've like, commissioned three pieces from him and this is the fourth commission and it's called Dinyandi and Guli likes to write about nature. He's always writing, um, trying to find answers from nature and he has great fondness of going into the wild wilderness of Iceland which is very very cold in the winter. So this is called Dinyandi because it's a waterfall in the west fjords of Iceland and it's this gorgeous waterfall and I went to I went to this waterfall. When you go, when you're far from it, it looks like a giant waterfall. It's like really, really massive, and the glacier water is so murky and it's so scary. And then you walk really close. You can hike really close to it. And then when you go to it, it's actually there's like multiple layers of water. It's not just one stream of water. There's like there's this the glacier water pouring, and it stops at the rock. And there's another layer stream of water and then it's less murky and then at the fourth layer you see this beautiful pool of water that is so gentle and there's the rainbows and the Icelandic elves and trolls that are out and jumping around and dancing um, and then there's another stream of water and it goes and goes so this so he he said there's seven sections of the waterfall so I'm gonna write the piece in seven sections so what I like to do is you can close your eyes and imagine the waterfall and like, it, you know, just like imagine there's like different strength of the stream or you can watch me play. It's totally up to you. I can't make you do anything. So <laughs> we all have free will. So this is called Dinyandi by Guli Bjornsson.
workout. It's like, <laughs> my hands are so, like, fire. When, when I play a lot, I always feel like my hands are like, I don't know, like, had some diesel oil or something. <laughs> Red Bulls. <laughs> um, I have two more pieces, but one more piece is contemporary, and then we're going to move back to 200 years ago. But this is the last contemporary piece, which I think is quite unique and quite amazing. And it's called Core, and it's written by this Latvian composer, Chris Ausnix. And he is a really good friend of mine, and I'll just tell you a little bit about the piece as I'm opening the file um, to, to make these really cool sounds. Um, so Chris is a very brilliant composer, and he is very stubborn. He's a very stubborn man, which I like, and that's fine. I think all composers should be stubborn. And um, he wrote this piece, and I said, this is not playable. This is, you, you're gonna give me a tendonitis. Like, I can't play this. This is impossible to play. And he said, well, okay, give me the corrections, and I'll, I'll correct it. And I said, okay, fine. And I, I, I sent him the things, like, we need to bring this down by 20 clicks under, we need to make it slower, we need to take out all these notes. And, um, and I sent this email, I was like, dear Chris, um, I see the attached PDF, thank you so much, so grateful, thankfully, best, respectfully, Gigi. And he writes back, dear Gigi, um, uh, thank you for the suggestions, but however, you cannot, it was like the most passive aggressive email chain ever, if you haven't seen our email chain, it's very passive aggressive. And um, she, he said no, he was like, no, I'm not gonna change it. You know, you, you have to figure it out. <laughs> Love that about composers. And I said, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look at the piece one more time. So the cool thing about this is that I'm so glad that he pushed me because I, I treat it as like not a guitar piece. I had to relearn the techniques and try something new, something that I had never done. And he's a crazy man, so he like built this um, program that shoots out weird sounds and guitar um, synth sounds, and um, it's quite lovely and very terrifying also. So this piece is, is like this. It's fast, slow, fast. And you will hear some electronics do not be alarmed, it is part of the musical experience. And then the slow part is really slow. There's not a lot of happening. Um, yeah, this is Core by Chris Ausnix.
Thank you. I have one last piece for you. And that's kind of the, the piece that really inspired all this journey, really. And it's called Caprice Number no. 24 by Paganini. And, you know, this is the piece that I've played for such a long time. And I've always wanted to, you know, really figure out what virtuosity is because that's the title that I always had. I'm like, she's a virtuoso, she plays all these pieces and yada, yada, yada. But I wanted to do it in my own terms with all the musical language that I, 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 I admire with all the friends that I think are so important. Um, but this is the root of everything. Caprice number 24, as I'm playing something that is basically impossible to play and something that actually is always challenging technically. Um, this is kind of the, 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 the inspiration of, of, of my project. So before I play this, I just wanted to thank Ms. Kuder and um, for having me. This has been so amazing. Thank you so much for letting me play my music. And uh, Dr. Lalish said, uh, it's just been six years since I've, I've seen him and I, I miss our seminar so much. I'm so thankful for your all your support and thank you audience members. I know this has been a very interesting <laughs> journey and thank you for being here. I really, really appreciate you um, being part of this. It's, it means the world. Thank you so much. So here it is, Caprice number 24 by Paganini.
we wanted to spend a few minutes to see if you had any questions about the new music. And uh, I'm not going to answer any of your questions. But uh, I just wanted to say that uh, Gigi has been, was an ex exceptionally creative um, fellow in my seminar program. And she's always sought to explore the talents of her contemporaries. And um, so I'm going to, does anybody have a question about the, uh, the program tonight? No. <laughs> Nobody? None of the pieces? How did you like the electronic music? Oh, thank you. I think it's a, um, you know, I studied with uh, Jacob Druckmann, who was a pioneer in electronic music, and I also studied with Milton Babbitt at the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Studio. So I have a very soft spot in my heart for electronic music. And I think that that composer integrated it in yeah. an incredibly beautiful way. Um, the, what does core mean? Um, That's the name of that piece. Yeah. So he wanted to kind of go for the roots of the meaning of core. So like the heart, it could mean the heart. Um, it's also, um, I, and it's also like meaning of a horn. So it has all these like different um, meaning that he thinks that core is coming from. So he wanted to kind of take this, this piece, this idea, and he wanted to see it in many different ways. And also like, also this kind of, he wanted to highlight his, his and my relationship into the piece and like creating something together. So, but um, I think for, for, for Cora, he wanted to, um, he was thinking of the, the, the root of the heart. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything, any other questions? Yeah. Gigi, that was an exceptional concert. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, <laughs> so it's a great, um, it's a really funny story, um, as you can tell. <laughs> I actually wanted to play the electric guitar, and um, I was really into Jimmy, Jimi Hendrix, and um, uh, Prince, <sighs> amazing player, PJ Harvey, I was listening to... Um, Eric Clapton and Richie Blackmore from Deep Purple. And I wanted to play in a stadium with my hair um, <laughs> blowing. And I wanted to play in a band. So I begged my parents when I was eight, can we go by a Fender Strat? I want a Fender Strat. I don't want a Gibson. I don't want any, I don't want, I don't want a Telecaster. I want a Fender Strat. I want, I want that. And then my parents took me to a music shop and they said, no but the classical guitar is on sale. And if you do this, if you take lessons and play really well for a year, we'll buy you an electric guitar, which never happened, by the way. I had to buy my own electric guitar, which I love. But, um, and, but the, the rest of it was history. I fell in love with the classical guitar. I, I, I just loved all the repertoire and the classical music and some of the jazz and, um, so yeah, I, that's kind of like the start of my journey. But I've always, always wanted to be in a band. Yes. Who inspires me the most in my career? Wow. Oh, that's a really great question. I mean, I really admire what um, Yo Yo Ma does. I think he's so amazing. I mean, just like the collaborations that he's done with all of the musicians, just like always pushing the boundaries. And, you know, I love the sense of like, there is no definition of what genre of music there is. It's just music and musical experience. That's also like what I try to embody in my, in my career, in my musical path. And I think um, that's someone that I've always like loved what he did with his rodeo, good rodeo and um, Silk Road. And, all of the collaborations he's done, um, just brilliant, brilliant artists, yeah. Do you still wanna be in a band? Oh, so yeah, I'm like, I'm trying to like do this like, 
you know, my um, alternate persona, um, alter ego kind of thing. Um, I have this band um, called, it's, it's mostly doom metal, um, where I have stacks of amps, and I just play really loud for an hour. That is like, it's in, mostly underground, and it's very, very scary, and then you just play very, very loud. And um, yeah, so that's, <laughs> I, I do, which is great, because I get, I get to do everything which is the fun part, yeah. I have another question. Yes. <laughs> Are your, is your family, is, it, is there a musical family? Um, my sister used to play the clarinet, but my parents are um, really into the arts, but they support it. They're not musical, but they, they are musical in their own ways. I used to practice, and my dad would be like, that's not a triplet. You got that rhythm wrong, and he would be screaming at me, so he, he is very musical. <laughs> Yeah, he's friend of. How was what was it like growing up in Korea, and how did you get to Curtis, and what's different about America and about your audition at Curtis? Oh yeah, this is really great question. Um, so living in Korea was really like interesting. I would say I went to college when I was fourteen in in Korea, and I I was accepted to this um, kind of like similar to Curtis. There was this like program where you can if you're talented you can go to college and um i was there but i really didn't enjoy it um it's not a very good environment for me and then i what happened was that jason bo who is also incredible guitarist um grammy winning guitarist um he came to korea gave a master class and i was just like oh my gosh, I have to come study with you. And then um, I followed him to the States, basically. I, I went up to him to the master class and I said, can I come study with you? And then at that time, he was teaching at CIM, um, Cleveland Institute of Music. And then um, I transferred from Cleveland to Curtis, who, which on he did um, end up in at Curtis Institute of Music too. So I followed him everywhere. Um, and America was like a very huge cultural shock, I have to say. I mean, I didn't speak a word of English. And um, you'll find this funny. <laughs> I, I used to practice my English by watching South Park. <laughs> you would not believe it. I would always like, hey, Kenny. Like, <laughs> and I would just like, this is like, this is what Americans say, the slangs. I gotta learn the slang so I can be cool. cool cool with the kids, um, which was horrible, but it was also like very good insight <laughs> into the culture. Yes, perfect. Um, so I have my laptop which uses this program called Logic Pro. And the composer can make these effect chains. So instead of having your traditional analog um, pedals, he can just automate more reverb here at this point of the piece, more delay at this point of the piece. And then he's gonna turn on the tape at like minute five. So um, he created the patch, I didn't do that. So that was kind of him, this brilliant um, master making. And then um, I'm using my pickup called Cremona pickup on my guitar. And it's going through this little box called uh, Focusrite. So in the middle of the piece, you'll hear um, all the sounds that were created before the resonance into this like, one giant mush. So he, he did that, I didn't do any of that. So yeah, he's, he's kind of brilliant. Did I hear Tibetan bowl music? Pardon? Did I hear Tibetan bowl music? Oh, right. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's very similar. There was like moment of like total meditation. Total of like nothingness. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. What's next for your career? What's next for my career? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm figuring it out. I mean, I, I just always love working with composers. I think that's like one of my biggest thing is because um, Beethoven at the time was a new music composer, right? Um, so my, my mission is like, oh, I want to discover as many Beethovens of the century, even though that'll take 
you know, he was like, his music was kind of difficult at the time. And some of the times like he got horrible reviews, but that's kind of what I want to do. I want to always work with living composers. Um, I think that's kind of like, I see my job as like the instrument, as the vessel of, of the voices of, of the composers. I think it's really a beautiful cosmos um, a relationship and we, we belong with each other. Um, but yeah, but I'm, I'm still going to do what I do and write music and, and just be happy. I'm, I'm trying to be more happy and not stressed out. <laughs> yes. Yes, so Unbound um, will come out this, this summer. Um, everything will be digital. Um, I'm trying not to do any, any physical copies anymore. So um, no, but you can find me on YouTube. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I actually have some, some pieces on Spotify and Apple Music. Yeah, yes. I do have a ritual. Do you want to? You do you want me to tell you? Tell you guys? It's really. Yeah. It's not a secret, actually. It's like I always tell my students to have a ritual. So I love this movie called um, Anchorman. <laughs> it's it, the Anchorman by Ron Burgundy, right? Um, so Veronica Cordingstone, when she gets a shot, because she's a woman anchor, right? She's the anchor woman who's never gotten a shot because of Ron Burgundy and they, they're lovers and it's very complicated, but Ron Burgundy has this like kind of breakdown because of his dog or whatever. So Veronica gets a shot at, you know, performing live, you know, reading the news. So before she goes on, she does this mantra, which I love. And she says power. And she says power like 20 times before she goes on live. So ever since then, I go on backstage, I just say, power, power. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I do. <laughs> That's a pretty good mantra. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Judy. And, and uh, she didn't talk about, or no one asked her about the emotional uh, aspect of her play. But I, I think that uh, when I listen to her, she plays with an incredible depth of emotion. And um, I would you say just something about what do you think emotion is and uh, what, how music communicates that? Yeah. Oh, this is a really, this is something that I always um, try to convey is like, Oh, I love, I, I think it's, um, I don't think music is a universal language. I think emotions, how you feel is a universal language, right? What you experience with the music, what you feel is universal, reversal, right? We feel sad, we feel angry. Um, we, we all have those feelings. And that's something that I always try to, you know, convey in my music. And I, I always think of empathy pure em like empathy with my music. What do, what do I feel? And I try to put everything that I have into my music. And, um, and I think that's kind of the most important thing as a, as a musician to really take the music to the next level is have this crazy amount of empathy. Yeah. Yeah. She said the magic word and um, she said it's empathy and she's projecting. So what she is projecting through her music is try to communicate what the music is saying to you and how she feels. And I think that a lot of artists have moved away from that idea. They think that they can actually recreate Beethoven or create, recreate Brahms. But the idea is that Brahms is speaking through you and you are communicating. We want to know, we want to know how you are communicating Brahms to us. So it is you that uh, is being presented to the audience, and it's you that is communicating to you, yeah. to the audience. And um, I think that's a very, very important 
uh, aspect of being an artist and in a uh, generation or in a time where uh, composers, well, it used to be that composers were the performers. Yeah. And uh, we've gotten away from that, I think, to a large degree. And I think Gigi is uh, on a path to try to revive, at least in part, that tradition. So thank you for coming today. Anything you want to add? No, thank you so much. Yes. I'm so thank you. Enjoy their doing.